that we defined a few slides ago. It was related to the kx direction. Mm -hmm. And luckily, accidentally, or actually not accidentally, it's constant. Why? Because it's the ratio between the sign and velocity. So if you are going to increase the complexity of the model, still that number, once the ray starts, it will be forever that one. What is the meaning in the travel times space? Because now we have used that piece of information to build the curves here. Simple ones. Or they can be much more complicated. There is one thing that will be always true. And it is very simple, I hope, to be seen. Now let's imagine that we have two rays, like in this case here, that have been leaving the source, and now we are arriving at two receivers, like in this way. So you can imagine the wavefront as you have seen before, okay? It's arriving here, and it's going to the top. If they were starting from different positions, they would appear here and here, okay? At the distance dx. Okay, at a distance here. Now, if you build in flat geometry this situation here, this will arrive first. This will arrive a little bit later because it has to run this part here to take care of this dx. Now, if you make this computation here, you will see that the sine of i over v, that is the ray parameter, is dt over dx. What is the t over the x? It's the derivative of a travel time curve. Let's check. Let's take the direct arrival. Direct arrival <coughs> is related to this line here. Right? Now, what is the direct arrival? Well, it's the ray, or the part of the wavefront, that was leaving at 90 degrees. So that's one. So the ray parameter of the direct arrival is one over alpha one. Yes, it's right. It's the t over dx for the direct. It's that one. It's the slope. It's constant. All the direct arrivals will be those related to an angle that was 90. Let's check the refracted one. Well, <coughs> it's this one now. Sorry for the terrible plot that I was doing here. Now, what is the derivative of this curve here? Well, it's 1 over alpha 2. Let's check. No, it's only a terrible plot, as I told you. You have to remember the this one. Okay. Please use your fantasy because I'm a terrible drawer. So let's make something. One over half of one. Reflected. Refract. Fine? Yeah. Three curves. We computed the t over dx for the first. Yes. The t over dx of the direct, it corresponds to one ray parameter, and it is the one with 90. Now, what about the reflected? Uh, refracted first. It's easier. Well, at a given position, <coughs> salute. At a given position, the derivative of this curve here will be always 1 over alpha 2. Well, the slope of that curve is the sine of ic over alpha 1, or, thanks to the Snello, 1 over alpha 2, yes. What about the reflected one? Now it's funny, because it's variable. 
because you have to remember that for the reflected, let's imagine the source is here, and here we have a set of receivers, the angle will be different according to the position of the receiver. Actually, the slope is changing. Right? According to the position x, the slope here will change. As an asymptote, these two will have the same slope. Actually, the receiver is so far that actually the rays direct and reflected are pretty much the same. What is funny that you can demonstrate that what all, whatever your model is, how wiggly the curve could be, you will always have this property here. That at position x, the derivative of the curve that you can take there will tell you the ray parameter of the ray that was arriving there. It's u exactly to the constancy of Snell's law. Ray parameter is very important, as we defined before, for body waves. And actually, you can generalize this to much more complicated models. For example, you can take a stack of layers with increasing velocity. Well, your travel time will be something like that, for example. Or you can increase the complexity to make a continuous variation of velocity. OK, the curve will be like that. And still, at position x, once you measure the travel time at your position, you will get an information about the ray that was leaving. It's very important. OK. Using these principles, you can start a body wave tomography problem using travel times and get information about the model of the Earth. But pay attention every time, because models, we have considered the simplest one. One layer over a hard space, with velocity that is lower than the hard space. OK? Now, you have to remember <coughs> that situations can be much more complicated than those ones. For example, you may have a velocity model with increasing velocity. Now, the ray paths will be something like that. And the travel time will be something like that. But pay attention, because if the slope, the gradient of increasing velocity is different, you will have this crossing here, and your travel time could be this one. Now, are we sure that we are able to see this backline here? Maybe not. And maybe we will guess that this is a layer over an space, a very simple one. Or what if you have an inversion of velocity? It's a shadow zone. You see here, no rays can arrive, and you have this. So actually, travel times in the real world can be much more complicated than the three lines that I was drawing there. And that's why, in many situations, you have to tune your model trying maybe to increase the parameters and trying to solve for what is called an inverse problem. And an inverse problem in seismology, but in all geophysics, is a really tough topic because you can always find a solution, maybe, adding parameters, but you're not sure that it is the right one. Because you can interpret this one in many ways, as you can imagine. So please remember that what we have just seen is just a very simple flavor about an inversion process. For example, what you can do is to take the travel times in the real Earth, you will see at the end of the slides, create a model to tune, to match them. How to match? Well, for example, what you can do is to take the differences and minimize them maybe with least squares, or maybe with much more sophisticated methods. All of these min minimization uh, 
procedures represent attempt, an attempt to solve an inverse problem. For body wave tomography, most of it is based on times, arrival times. Remember that your prediction about the data, for example, time, is a function of the parameters of your model. For what we have studied, we have used three. Alpha 1, alpha 2, H. Or beta 1, beta 2, H. Just three. You can imagine, and there, I have a huge set of hidden slides here. There are some examples on your textbook. But you can do, look, but they are not officially inside. There should be one with, what is it? Okay. That's an example of a flavor of a multiple layers problem. It's a matter of bookkeeping. You have to make an iteration about what we did. So no new physics there. Let's say that the computational effort is larger. But the principle is still the same. Use a travel time and compute slopes to get the ray parameter and to fit it according to a model of the Earth. Now, is it a good procedure? Yes. I'm going to show, you, to show you the first example. That's Andrea Morovicic. And in Zagreb, well, let's say. How we could make our model for the first time? Yeah. How can we predict uh, the arrival time? It depends on your data. You said it's different. the prediction of uh, oh, we did the arrival time. No, no, wait. We did it here. That's a prediction. But we, we don't lost. know the velocity in the Earth. Pardon? We, we don't know the velocity. Ah, you have to change them. Now, let's imagine that you collect data now. So, at the different axes, you have data, you have waveforms, and you have to match them. That's your work. That's the theory. You have to tune your parameters looking for the best matching. It's matching of the first arrival to the arrival. It's up to you. Do you want to do it with the reflected ones? You can match that. Uh, come on, guys. This is only the starting. <laughs> <laughs> it's your business, not mine. What I'm telling to you is that the theory is just this one. You can add 100 layers, and you will have 100 of these segments here. Now you have many more parameters. You can add infinite parameters. You know how? Putting a continuous variation of velocity. Now it's time to match. Uh, every time that you change a parameter, you're changing something here. But you have data with errors. And maybe you were looking for a first arrival. Maybe it's not the first. That's the real world. This is only the tool for the direct problem. So given a set of parameters to make a prediction. Inversion is comparing with data and make the inversion. But the funny, maybe not so funny thing, is that <clears throat> this is valid for, how to say, some approximation. Now, do you want to see the real thing? The left panel. Left panel are the real data on a global scale. Distance. Wait a second, that's distance in angular distance. It's half of the Earth. And time. Can you match these ones? No. First, they are curves, not straight lines. Oh, 
Come on, it's a continuous variation. You see the reflection? Now you can match them. You have the formulas. That's your work, not mine, because I'm doing something else. No, I'm joking, but what I want to say is, OK, now it's time to create a model that is satisfying these arrivals. This is what we're going to discuss. But the tools to start the inversion are those simple formulas, except one. And this is what we have to do now. Because now, Morovicic, well, this is what Morovicic did, sorry. The answer is here. These are data. 1909, Moho. Uh, wait a second. He was using the observatory in Zagreb, that is not far from here, <coughs> with some regional arrivals. So his findings, and you see here, he was matching this with the Moho, with this model. There you go. It's fine. So he did it. That is valid locally, or if you prefer, on average, in that region, in the Balkan region. But from that work, Moho started as a nickname. Okay? So he was able to use, look, this is, these are data. I don't think it's very visible here, but these dots are data. And the lines are predictions. So it's matter to change the parameters thickness, velocities, to match them. Please notice that the dots contain uncertainties. So there are many lines maybe that can go there. So the solution is never unique. The real problem is to get which one is the best. Who knows? So how to start? That's important for tomography because usually the starting parameters can influence the solution. But this is really beyond this course. I think in the second term you're going to do something about this. Okay? Now, <coughs> that's one of the first examples of application of what we discussed. But to go beyond this and to look for the most important findings in body wave tomography at the beginning of the last century, now we have to take care about more realistic waveforms, like this one. Oh, God. How many of them? This means that there are, that there are mo much more interfaces than one. And, well, now you get also a flavor about it, something that is totally different. And this is what I hope we are going to discuss in the last 15 minutes today. Look at this arrival here. Oh, it's much larger. It's totally different. It's a wave train, larger, and magic word, dispersed. You see here? That's a dispersion. Long periods are arriving first compared to this one. The next topic. Now let's give a look to these ones. OK, to predict those ones, you need to increase the complexity or the realism of your model. Otherwise, you cannot fit it with just two or three parameters. For example, we should go to a spherical scale, to a global scale, taking into account sphericity of the Earth, taking into account the fact that velocity has some abrupt changes. Look at this one. Mental in the core, CMB, core mental boundary, was discovered looking at the disappearance of S waves. So it was an inversion. And you have to give now names to the different possible phases. And there are many. Because please remember the conversions. P can become an S, an S can become a P. You have a huge number of possible arrivals now. It's a matter to create a vocabulary. OK, what to do, as usual? We cannot do all the work here, but just to follow the, the logical steps. The first and most important one. Let's imagine that our Earth, on a global scale, is like that, homogeneous. Very nice. The rays, wavefronts, will propagate as 
straight lines, okay, it's not working. With this model, we cannot predict the real arrivals. So let's put there. Maybe we can use a model with a continuously increasing velocity. What's going to happen there? Well, it's not slow. The ray will turn towards the surface and then it will bounce and go back. Uh, it's valid on, let's say, local regional scale, but not global scale, because the match of arrivals is not following this model. Can we do something better? Yes. But first, we have to solve one problem. If we look at the travel times at a global spherical scale, we cannot use the same definition of the ray parameter. Let's understand why. SNES law is still valid. SNES law do does not care about we have a normal, reflection, refraction, right? And if we have much more layers, what we have to do is to follow it exactly. Maybe now it's going like that. And so on, and so on, and so on. Bookkeeping. But if we are in a spherical geometry with different layers, now we have a problem. The normal here is not the normal here. So on each interface, SNAP is working, but the normals are not the same. Oh gosh, what about this? It was so elegant in flat geometry that P was constant. Good news. If we redefine, with just a tiny correction, the ray parameter in spherical geometry, we are getting a, um, a value, an expression that is going to be constant for the life along the life of a seismic ray in spherical geometry. Let's give a look to this sketch. Now, let's imagine we have a ray. Please remember that a ray is representing a wave. So it's arriving to this interface. There will be a contrast here, right? Okay, part of it will be reflected, part of it will be refracted. And let's remember that if it is a P, it can become an SV, and blah, 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 all this stuff. Okay, let's imagine that we have another one now. The ray is going here, and then again reflected. If it is increasing, it will make different bumps, and then going up again. But, SNES law is still valid at each interface, okay? So sine of i over v1 will be sine of i prime over v2. Good. You could say, but also here, yes, but this, this line is not this line. They're not parallel anymore. But what we can do is to use this triangle here that is built considering the center of the Earth. Now, if you give a look to it, this angle and this angle will be defined according to the two distances from the center of the Earth. And this is a 90 degrees angle. So actually, let's imagine now to write this quantity here. The distance times the flat parameter, the old parameter. Okay, Snell's law. But now looking at this triangle here, this quantity with sine i prime, look here, can be written with this. Now, check this and check this. Now, after two bouncings, it's the same quantity. All this mess to say that if in a spherical geometry we define as a ray parameter this quantity here, it's going to be constant. So, the message to take home is that when you move from flat, local, to spherical, global, 
vision of the Earth from a seismological point of view. You can still do travel time plotting and tomography, but instead of using this as a definition of the rate parameter, you have to take care of it was sine of i over v. And here, if you get the information about p, you get an information about this. That's the trick. Now what you have to do is to change this with angular distance and put here the distance from the center of the Earth. And that quantity will still be constant. Um, one thing to remember. Let's give a look to the units. In flat geometry, it was dt over dx. It's a sort of a slowness, okay? Time and space. <coughs> In spherical geometry, this is an angle. That's why to put things back, you have to remember that the rate parameter is not one over velocity, but it is r over a velocity. So please remember this. But the meaning will be exact. This. How it's working in spherical geometry? Well, <coughs> what we have to imagine now is that if we take the two rays that we considered before in flat geometry, now in this system here, they are propagating, as well as with the waveform, in a sphere. So now, let's take two rates. This has a parameter p, and it's going there. The other one is, has a little bit more than p, and it's going here. What is the distance here? Well, it's the radius of the Earth times the difference in angles, so angular distance. How long it's taking this one? Well, with this approximation, it will be the velocity of this region here times the difference in time. Now, if you build and if you consider this triangle here, you can write this expression. And actually, if you want to compute dt over d delta, you will get the spherical rate parameter. So still the same meaning. So moving from flat to sphere, if we add an r, we get the same information. And what is important is that we know the velocity that was traveled by the ray. That's still the idea. What to do next? Well, now we can take our spherical model. We can imagine to build our rays to make them propagate, the technique is called ray tracing. So trace rays in different models. Remembering the definition of the ray parameter in a spherical Earth, and now we can imagine that we have a source. Now, at global, we need energy. A hammer is not enough to feel the vibration in, I don't know where, but in Australia. Our hammer is not enough. We need something that has energy. So an earthquake. Let's imagine that we know where the earthquake is. Still another inverse problem. But let's imagine that we know. OK, what we raise, the wavefronts are doing, they are propagating in a model, where maybe velocity is increasing. Okay. They will turn, but will appear somewhere at the station. Their appearance will be decided by the velocity structure of the Earth. And time and place t and x is decided by the velocity. So you see, when they start, they will feel the velocity at the source region. Then they are going to propagate maybe at depths where velocity is larger. So they're going to be turned, snap. And then they will appear somewhere where, well, here they will feel the velocity of the station. But along all this trajectory, this quantity is still the same. So actually, you can imagine that 
sooner or later, at a given depth, the angle here will be 90, and so they will feel exactly this velocity. And then they will appear. So what you have to do now is to wait for earthquakes and collect data and plot them. Yes? OK. From this uh, diagram, there the, the are uh, stations there, seismic stations, and the earthquake is there. So if we are going to give a warning that the earthquake will happen, happen what are we going to analyze? A warning of what? A warning of uh, earthquake will happen. Can you imagine what is the amplitude of the waves at these distances? It's nothing. Okay. Tsunami is different because it has actually no energy loss except spreading. But for seismic waves, once you travel at more than 3,000 kilometers, your waves can be felt just by a seismometer. You're not going to shake. So it's not important to give a warning at 3,000 kilometers. It's important to give a warning at maybe 100 kilometers. Or, except in few but important cases, like in Mexico City, where the distance is not that important, warning is important near the source, not far from the source. So. This is an ideal situation for tomography, not for hazard. Usually the radius of the maximum intensity of an earthquake rarely is over, let's say, 100, 200 kilometers. So this sketch here is not realistic. This is for tomography, not for warning. Unless you want this information for tsunami warning, that's different. You can imagine why, because the P wave velocity, for example, is much larger than gravity waves in the ocean. If you remember, I told you that a P wave can travel at 8 kilometers per second. The tsunami wave can travel at 0 0.2 kilometers per second. So maybe this is a warning for tsunami, not, not for seismic waves. But today here, the point of view is a purely tomographic or seismological one, not for us. Okay? Also because you're not interested into body waves. You're interested into surface waves for hazard at these distances. So um, I have to say that this sketch, this cartoon, is not for warning. Unless you consider tsunami warning. By the way, you have to know but this, yes? If it is not for warning, then why predict them? Pardon? Why predict if it is not for warning? If it is not? For warning. Because you want to know what's inside the earth, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you don't know that there is a coromental boundary. <coughs> Since I'm working in hazard, I like your question, but please, half of the efforts, if maybe more than half of the efforts of, of seismology is uh, trying to understand what's... Still, we, we cannot see many parts of the Earth. So, today is not for hazard, it's for tomography. But it's important. Believe me. Also because the interior of the Earth, maybe on a more local scale, is important for hazard. Structural models are really important for us. So, before you have seen a flat configuration, good for us. Now I'm trying to give to you a global vision because we would like to know what's, what do we have there. And we don't. Still we don't. Okay? So, what I'm showing to you now are the first attempts to collect data. You have to know that the first Seismic signal officially, officially has been recorded in 1897 in Germany or better, 1906 in Japan. Before seismology was a purely theoretical science. But look, from those years on, 
The first discoveries, and maybe the most important ones, occurred. And look at this. You see travel times with dots. So data was beginning to be accumulated. And models of the Earth began to be developed. And look at this jump here. There was an indication of a fluid part. That is, the core mental boundary. Gutenberg was guessing it. It was not that far. It was not that far. And then Inge Lehmann discovered, not a long time ago, but we have an interior core that is solid. So you see these very simple principles starting to create a very realistic model of the Earth. And it is the only one that we have. Now, <clears throat> the best, also if it is a, maybe a too simple cartoon, but we can imagine is something like that. Now, for us, it's sort of a kid's game to plot this one. But it's hiding at least 40 years of research. What is for sure is that we have an outer core that is liquid. You know why? Because here we have no S waves and we have a shadow zone of P. The only way to explain it is to put an external core that is liquid. Then this radius here was computed by Inge Lehmann using what? Well, the conversions. Because you can imagine that here S waves cannot propagate. It's a free boundary. Forbidden zone. So for S waves, the Earth as a whole. The flat version would be a plate. So funny. But please remember that some S wave here can be converted into a P. The P can travel with a huge deflection because now velocity is lower. So the ray is going down. But that this interface here can be converted into an S again. So now you see this chain of conversions can be explained only creating a simple model like this. Well, it's not simple. Not simple at all. From these early studies until, well, let's say 2000, these studies were using many phases because now a seismic instrumentation is much to say, uh, well, we can say better, more developed than at the beginning of the last century. <coughs> so a huge amount of data has been accumulated. A huge amount of possibility of data processing has been developed after the computers, after the Second World War, if you want. And so we have been creating the best, but it is not real, 1D model of the Earth. And this is what we are going to see just now. Using what? Waves. Well, that's another cartoon about shadow zones for P and forbidden zones for S. Very simple. What we have to do is now to create a vocabulary. Because we have many possible arrivals. Direct. Once reflected. Triple reflected. And so on. You, you may have conversions, a P to S, and many others. So remember, now we can create a, pretty much an infinite set of names with many letters that are associated to possible reflections. Then you can add other things, because P can enter into the outer core, inner core, and getting out. So capital K and capital I means inside the outer core, inside the inner core. A P can enter just here, just K, you see here. Or maybe it can be reflected by the inner core, small i. Or maybe the S can be diffracted by the outer core. You have many. A huge set of possible seismic body wave arrivals with their arrival times. If you know the source and you have a set of receivers on the Earth and now we have a huge number, we can create some models using a huge vocabulary. And the result 
is, well, that's a possible sketch, you see, here. And you can create a set of travel times. Now, on the left, it's the real data accumulated until 1991. That is a sort of a milestone, because in those years, and a few years later, it was published what we called PREM, P-R-E-M, Preliminary Reference Earth Model. How it is done? Well, you have to take data, left. You see how many dots. You have to put the names, direct, reflected, S converted to P on the core, you have many. And tune your parameters trying to best fit these curves. And this is an example of a computation. What is the result? The result is, well, there are more than one. Depends on the data that you're using. But, for example, maybe this is the most famous one. Preliminary reference Earth model. Can, can this be categorized as a statistical model? Since we are fitting. Well, if you say statistical, I would... I would say no, because there is no distribution here. Uh, it's not a statistical. There is an uncertainty. Um, let me tell you, that, well, it's the result of an inversion process that is in, how to say, using statistics. But here, actually, you, would, you could use statistics if you have error bars. So if you are going to measure a neutrino, I don't know, you have error bars. Here we don't. But that's worst. You know why we don't? Well, let's imagine to take a seismogram recorded here in Trieste for an earthquake in Japan. With digital signals, you can easily see arrivals and take a very good time. But you have noise. Maybe what you label as a first arrival is not. And more importantly, maybe you don't know the exact position of the source. So maybe you're making some errors that are not easily to be quantified there. Let's say that it is a powder, but there's not a really statistical way to be processed. So in a sense, yes, it is statistical because it is an inversion. But in another way, I would say no, because we don't have a control over the statistics. So yes and no. And what is more important is that the result, the studies, actually, these two models, and this is prime, this is YASP 91. It's coming from YASP, that is the International Agency of Seismology and should be part of it, but I don't remember the name. It's 91, so it was published in 91. These models have been, how to say, a little bit changed with new data in these years, but are not very different. These are, let's say, stable. And what you see here is the distribution of P velocity, S velocity, versus depth. Wait a second. Here it is written also density. That's not a trivial piece of information. Uh, it's not my cup of tea, but please do remember. What we know from seismology, RVP and VS, density cannot be derived directly. That's why usually gravity is used to make an additional inversion and to look for density. It's not trivial. So let's say VP and VS. Now what you notice here is that the model of the Earth, this are very similar. I like this one because please remember that we have the atmosphere. We can breathe. P waves, sound waves, but just a tiny coupling here. Then you see there is a low-velocity layer here that is the boundary between 
lithosphere and the stenosphere, but that is a rheological distinction. This is just velocity. Increasing. Coronamental boundary, no S. Then S again. OK? And P here is increasing. Now, that's the best reference model that we can imagine. But it does not exist. It's laterally homogeneous. The Earth is not. Yes, it is at a very, how to say, a very good approximation. It is, especially at these depths here. But on the top, you can imagine the difference between oceans and continents. So actually, the first, let's say, 300 kilometers, difference, lateral heterogeneities can be very important. But the best, 1D, with just one direction of heterogeneity, the radial one. This is the best. And of course, vertical direction, or better, radial direction, as we will see in the last uh, lecture of this course, when we will speak about three modes, is the one containing the most important discontinuities at the global scale. The most important, the free surface. The other, core mental boundary. The other, outer inner core. Was a very important discontinuities. But have been found just using travel times. Ray parameters in flat and spherical Earth. Something like that. Now, we have not entered at all into these details, but the tools that you can use to perform local, regional, global tomography are just these ones. Of course, with better maybe techniques for inversion. Here I put a link, let's see if it is working, to a page that is containing what we call the reference models. Let's see if it is working. It's not. Yes. Here you have many. And I think that each of them, here for example it's YASP, you should have, okay, you have it. Why they are different? Because they can use additional data. For example, someone is using surface wave tomography. You should ask, what is that? Next topic. Three modes. Next plus one topic. And final. So according to the data that you are processing, you may have some differences about this. Some are more valid at a um, global scale, some are more valid maybe as an approximation at a local scale. But you have a set of them. What to do now? Well, please do remember, as a final version, that we have this distinction here by layers essentially decided, discovered by seismological parameters, the PVS. Please do remember that on long time scales, you may have also other distinctions, like lithosphere and asthenosphere. Those are rheological differences. Lito, litho, coming from Greek, means region. Asthenosphere is still a solid, because BS is not zero, you have seen. But on long time scales, it's behaving like a fluid. But Yes, here it's not zero. Come on. It's not a fluid. On short time scales, when a wave is passing. But on long ones, a stenosphere can behave with, like a fluid with very large viscosity. But it's not. This is a fluid. Outer core is a beautiful fluid. Magnetic. So, before moving to the last topic for today, and it's enough, let's amuse ourselves with some, with some animations. First, the, okay, some animation now in a spherical world, because we made the jump. Now we can go spherical. 
These are the animations in terms of wavefronts <coughs> of S, so S waves. You see they are increasing the angle because velocity on average is increasing with depth. And then they are touching the outer core, but it is a fluid, so it's a free surface. They cannot penetrate. Forbidden. So they are running in this way. And you have to imagine that they are going to propagate, 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 propagate. Oh no, sorry, this was the one we asked before, so let me kill it. Um, what's next? Let's give it to this one. SS, reflected, reflected. Rays are easy to be traced. Wavefront contain the physics. So look, direct. Any interface is causing reflections. Look, uh, let me try to stop it. Look here. Tiny amplitudes, but still there is one due to the first discontinuity. Then you will see also this one. Look at this one. Bouncing from the core mental boundary. You have many others here. Sir, sir, the question the depth which was around 500 We are going to discuss about that just now. That is the depth of a source. Okay. So is it a vertical or horizontal depth? The source? No, you have to imagine it as an explosion. It's not. But you have to wait for the second term mm -hmm. to understand what is an earthquake, I hope. For now, you have to imagine a point that is radiating energy. It's not vertical, it's not horizontal. In this animation, it's pretty much isotropic. It's not. So if, if we know the, the time taken for to cover that, we could divide it to get the velocity of that wave. Divide by what? Divide by the time covered by that depth. If you take simply the distance, and time, you get an average velocity that is not that one. All the lecture that we, that we discussed today is that you, you have to do something better. You have to take a travel time and take the derivative, and you will get the rate parameter, not the velocity. Velocity is going to change along the trajectory. You will have an integral vision of that. So you have to use that one in conjunction with other information, like this one. You have to use all the possible phases. So if you have a distance, this is an angular distance, please remember. And if you take the time, you will get the rate parameter of that phase, not immediately velocity. You have a velocity over the sine of an angle. It depends. The direct, yes. If you, take, if you know that the wave that is arriving to you is direct, you can take the distance and divide it by time, okay, you will get direct velocity. But for reflections and the other, no. What you get is the ray parameter. So the principle is that one, but please remember that it is P, not V. Okay? Now, on this web page, oops, sorry, you have many other examples. So you are very welcome to visit them. If you want to, let's see if I have other preloaded here. OK. You can plot many of them. OK. What I'm going to show to you now is a similar animation, but it is done in a totally different way. So, if you want to visit that web page, is no, this one. That one is no more working. What is this? Oh, no. 
Hidden slides, don't worry. This one. Okay? I was updating the, the, the set of slides because I changed something, as I told you, but I cannot. So if you want to remember it, it's here. If you're, let's check if maybe this is online. <clears throat> no. Um, but if you have already downloaded this lecture, it's written there. Ah, uh, it's not working. I edit the link. Now, we still have 20 minutes. For at least three minutes, now we are going to see some animations. Like this. And here, we're making a sort of a pose. This animation here has been produced a few years ago by West Session, and at that time, his pitch is given. Why I'm showing this to you? For two reasons. Three reasons. First, they are nice. Second, they have been produced by one of the authors of your beautiful textbook. I'm not getting money from them, okay? <laughs> and in that textbook, today, since today, you're going to solve some exercises. So in 20 minutes, I'm going to send an email. No, better. I'm going to send it now. Should be prepared here. Go to page and solve these problems. And you have time until next Monday. Plenty of time. They are simple. They are coming from your textbook. They are applications of what we discussed the previous lecture and today. So it's a way to absorb things. would work. <laughs> then, the third reason, the most important one, actually there are two, is that they are produced not using body waves, but they have been produced with model summation. Yes, so the last topic of this course is the one used to produce these animations that are not about that topic. And what is funny is that one of these animations will show to us the next topic, that is surface waves. Now let's give a look to them. You can read them. OK, that's the model. This animation is made only for S waves. So the Earth is a strange Earth. It has a hole. In this first model, the Earth is homogeneous. It's a plate. OK? Good. Then you will see the representation of the source. Uh -uh, that's a focal mechanism. You have to wait. And now you will see some animations. Maybe they are not nice as the other ones. But definitely they contain the wave fronts of seismic waves using model animation. <coughs> now you will see the signals, synthetic signals, that you can produce at three different positions. with the labels. These are simple waveforms. Why? Because the Earth is homogeneous. It has not all the phases. But it has the most important features, the free surface and the core mental boundary. We can do better. We can take the prime. Now, this is the model. It's more complicated. You will see that the wavefronts are more irregular because they are a little bit deformed by heterogeneities. What is the cause 
of the dispersion layer on the signal. There is no dispersion here. Which is dispersion? What do you mean? Because in the next one there will be dispersion, but not in this. Okay, the signal, the first signal. Oh, yeah. It's not dispersed. It has a phase that is not a spike. Okay. This is a spike, maybe. It's not. But the earthquake source is not a simple source. So actually, these features here, they are not dispersion, but these are different phases. With taking into account that the function, the time function of the source, is not a delta. So it has something like that. The signature of that one is here, is here, is here, is here, and so on. Still no dispersion. If you want to see dispersion, you have to take this. Oh, no, not this. Who is this one? Now, the only difference between this animation and the previous one is the depth of the source. So before you were asking about depth. Now you will see an effect. Look at this. OK, that is this version. And that is a way that we don't understand. What is that? Oh, it's love. Beautiful. Our next topic. Why that wave is there? Surface waves. And if you see them again, you will notice that their amplitude is very large. Why? Because they are cylindrical waves and not spherical. They're not propagated like spherical wavefronts, but by cylindrical ones. And they are trapped to the surface. You can see them there. How can we study them? Here we are. So I'm going to use this animation as a transition between the world of body waves and seismic phases that can be used with travel times <coughs> in the last 10 minutes we're going to study the beautiful idea of here you are <coughs> okay rain we will start with rain now Sir Lord Rayleigh was also called William John Strutt. It was the real name. He won the Nobel for discovery of argon, as far as I remember. I already told you. He's the father of acoustics. He's also the father of his waves. Now, look at the year 1888. Before any seismogram, real seismogram to be recorded. And he was calling this fundamental contribution, waves propagated on the plane surface of an elastic solid. We did it. Today, this morning, surface, waves, we did it. We solved it. What have we been missing? Look at the ingredients that he has been using. Oh, the usual ones. Displacement as the gradient of the scalar potential, good old friend. The curl of a of the vector one, good old friend. They satisfy wave equations, P and S, displacement, P, S, scalar. What's new here? Nothing. Actually, what we're going to do now, in the last 10 minutes, is to revisit it. P and SB. You remember how we started this morning? We did it. What if SB? Uh -oh. Critical angle. Because alpha is larger than beta. There will be an angle beyond which energy will travel here. You seem surprised. 
We studied it. Are you the same person that were here? <laughs> Come on. Maybe I'm wrong. No, the string, that's a nightmare. P and SB. And I told you, P and SB can talk each other. X, Z, ZX. SH, no. Okay, PP, SB. The angle is smaller because beta is less than alpha. What if SB is incoming? SB, SB, P is larger. Snap, right? I want a yes. Right. Okay, so there is an angle beyond which this is critically reflected. And it is related to the ratio alpha over beta. I want a yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Randy was thinking. Is it possible that also SV is critically reflected and going together at a surface with P critically reflected? As you can imagine, the answer is yes. Otherwise, we will not. We are not staying here speaking about Rayleigh. <laughs> and so he was saying, is it possible? that, okay, the first image is fine with us. SB, SB, P. Beyond critical reflection. Do you remember R, R beta and R alpha? Critical reflection means that C, horizontal apparent velocity, is less than wave speed. So now this P wave is traveling with a velocity that is less than alpha and that is imaginary in Z and C is less than alpha now Rayleigh's idea is it possible that also an SV is critically reflected And now also, beta is critical, and they go together with the same velocity there. You should see. Yes. Is he crazy? <laughs> he was not. And the idea here is simply that if this situation is possible, who is making this situation possible? The boundary conditions. They are ruling everything there. If it is possible, <clears throat> there is a common velocity, less than alpha and less than beta, with which P and SB can interfere constructively at an interface. So the idea here is, is it possible that P and SB, SH is out of the game, because we are doing something like that, out of the game, that they can meet together at the interface now, P has been slowing, slowed down. So can wait, yes, but it's slower. And they can go together as an interference along the surface. OK, I told you. I was going to show to you again this slide here. And it is the same slide as this morning. You agree with me? Yes. No tricks. Kx, horizontal apparent velocity, and we can write it for alpha and beta. Okay? Now give a look to this. When C is less than alpha, that part is negative, the square root is imaginary, and so is representing something that is damped in Z but can go along x. Rayleigh's idea. Let's take again what we have been using this morning 
exactly the same. Ux, uz, the p part, the sd part. Now, and that's the condition, he had been writing, well, at that time he had been writing the two potentials that were speaking each other with what? With a common horizontal upper end velocity. It's interference there. K, omega over C. The other things are accommodated by R alpha and R beta, but with this condition, otherwise they cannot exist. So, what he was going to develop was this idea. With these expressions here and with this one, what does it mean? That they are traveling together along x and damped along z. Or, in different words, you can rewrite it like that. What is the coupling? The common k. The common horizontal apparent velocity. Now, was he right or not? Yes. Because what you have to do is to apply the boundary condition. What is the boundary condition? Well, we have used it. <coughs> the components Zx and Zz have to be zero here. So what we have to do is to take, to compute that. We have used, we have potential. We have the use here. We have to compute the strain and then the stress. So we're, we have used the usual definition of displacement and now we have these two new potentials. They are not new, but they have this common feature, K containing a C that is less than alpha and beta. Is it possible? Well, that condition is mapped into this equation. It's time for lazy people. It's really late today and we're spending so long time here. Let's take to simplify the algebra and approximation. Let's consider a Poisson solid. If we consider Poisson solid, lambda is equal to mu, and Vp, or alpha, is the square root of 3 of beta. As you know. Okay. That equation becomes this. And that's, my friends, a cubic. Yes, it is a cubic. 6, 4, 2. A cubic algebraic equation has always three solutions. Maybe two of them are complex conjugate. But we are looking for a real one. And well, if you solve it, you will see that there is one solution, real, when, and just one, and C is less than beta. It's approximately 92% of beta. So he was right. The free surface can cause to slow down critically reflected P waves that can interfere with critically reflected SB waves and they can go together, being a different wave. As you can imagine, these are called Rayleigh waves. Two important things. They can exist just in a house space with a free surface. Just that. Just a free surface. Second, they are not dispersed because that expression does not contain frequency. So it's not the end of the course because from the next lecture we are going to speak about surface waves in layered media and we will have what we are waiting for. The other family of surface waves, love waves, and dispersion. But in this world, that is the same world that we visited this morning, with P, S, B, S, H, blah, 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 we found a new wave. We'll be missing it. We were not considering this condition. So Rayleigh waves can exist in a half space, homogeneous half space, 
Their velocity is decided by alpha and beta, and for a Poissonian solid, it's 92% of beta. We have to give a look to them to conclude how they are made. Well, now it's a I'm very proud to show to you the usual web page, but now you have all of them. Sound, if you remember. String, or P waves, S waves. Not these ones. OK, ready waves. This is the animation that you can produce with Mathematica, with very simple equations, that are the ones that we have just seen. We have to add two things. This number here was called horizontal apparent velocity since this morning. From the next lecture on, it will be called for surface waves phase velocity. You should say, why phase? Well, because it's not the group velocity. And you should say, come on, there is no dispersion. They are the same. Right. For Rayleigh waves, there is no way to distinct between, to make a distinction between phase and group because they're not dispersed in this case here. But from the next lecture, we're going to find dispersion and C will be phase velocity. We have just one. It's that number. In a more sophisticated problem from the next lecture, it will become one of the eigenvalues. But once you find it, now you can go back and to write the equations of the displacement related to this. And if you do that, there you go. Now you have C. The boundary, boundary condition was given to you C. Now you take that value and you go back and you write UX and UZ. And there you go. How we are made? We have two components of motion, Ux and Uz, of course. P and Sb, together, Ux and Uz. They are traveling together with a horizontal apparent velocity that is C, less than S. They are out of phase, the two components, and they are damped into the out space. And if you want a picture, a static picture, there you go. This is one of the final pictures for today. Two components of motion, one horizontal, the other vertical. Together, they create a trajectory that is an ellipse. Retrograde on the top. Just here, you see that's you. Just vertical at a given distance, at a given depth, and then prograde. They're not that easy. These are the measurements made by experiments. Experiments. Which ones? In which kind of experiment can we imagine to study this kind of waves? In the Earth? No, we don't have a house space. We have layers. But actually, if you go in a lab and you, t you take uh, something like that, maybe five centimeters, you take a material, and you go to very high frequency, the, how to say, penetration depth of a Rayleigh wave is so thin that actually we see this table as an abyss. And this is a measurement that you can do with a sensor and with a vertical force, very near distance, at very high frequency. And what you get is this signal here. Look, it's coming later than the P, later than the S, that is this time here, and it's the joining of them, and look at the huge amount of amplitude. Why? Because P waves, as we have seen during all of the day, they propagate as spheres. So on one section of the wavefront, just a tiny amount of energy is left. 
These are created at the interface and they are moving like cylindrical shapes. So the decay is 1 over the square root of r, not as 1 over r. That's why their amplitude is much larger. But bad news. If you take a normal seismic recording, we don't see those simple signals like those. They are much more complicated. OK, we do understand now P, S, many phases in the middle. But wow, that's different. It's in three components, so also SH has to be involved. And it is dispersed. Yes, this is dispersed. We have to move. But we have been starting what we will call surface waves, with rain waves in a house space, the simplest case. And if you give a look to them, here you go. So let's close up with this animation here. Look, a particle on the top. It's moving like an ellipse. OK? Retrograde. Here, motion is nearly vertical. And here is with a tiny radius rotary. Now, please remember that in this configuration, amplitude is decreasing with depth as an exponential, because they are critically at the surface. So their, their motion here is really tiny. You see, it's much more larger at the surface. And look at the perturbation that is traveling as E. Actually, what we have done today is to play with k. Vector k, kx, kz. kx in, for normal body waves was nothing else than ray parameter. <coughs> if you remember, I was writing this this morning. I told you, alpha or beta. We call that p, right? But I also told you, this can be called 1 over C. And this was horizontal apparent velocity. Now, if you put that C there, now it's the velocity with which radio waves are propagating there. They are horizontal. Can we compare them to ocean waves? Find the difference. You can. You can compare them. Um, yes and no. The motion in gravity waves, that is on the top, is still an ellipse. But according to the approximation that you are dealing with, shallow water, deep water, the ellipse can be a circle whose, whose radius is getting smaller and smaller. And those are called deep water waves. But please do remember one thing. Deep water waves are caused by gravity. These are due to elastic forces. They are much slower. You cannot find surface waves in water. You know why? Because we have only P. We don't have S in water. So I would say, yes, they are similar, but the motion is very different. Because here, trajectory is simpler. It's always or a circle whose radius is getting smaller and smaller, OK? And it's decaying exponentially. But it's not complicated as this one. Because there is retrograde, vertical, prograde. And you will see in the next lecture that as soon as you add layers, these ones are getting much more complicated than the other ones. If you want, both are the result of interference at the free surface. But really are P and SB. The other ones are free surface under gravity. Okay. What's wrong with the interference of P and SB waves? 
there is a phase difference there out of case. So is there a possibility of destruction? Yeah, no, they are constructive. No, no. The phase difference here is constant. Look. <coughs> when you build them, you write u as a p term and a s p term. Then, if you want both critically reflected, c, sorry, it's this one. The horizontal apparent velocity, if it has to be common, it, it has to be common. And here, it has to be the same. So they are not out of phase. Ux and Uz, my out of phase was wrong. What, what I was trying to say here is that the solution here is sine and cosine. So they are out of phase, but the phase difference is constant. And the trajectory is an ellipse. So sorry for saying out of phase. It was out of phase in the sense that one is sine, the other is cosine. But actually, when you build them in X, both are exponential by K, exponential by K. If you want the phase, is different in the Z, in the potentials. And actually, it's giving out, as you can see here, here, it's not evident, it's here. Look at this z behavior. In both cases here, it's e to minus something z. So the two components, you see, they are decaying at a little bit different rate, but they are both decaying and going to zero with z. Please remember that this vision here is for every frequency. That expression is not containing frequency. Of course, wavelength will be different if you consider different frequencies. If you take 100 hertz, 2000 hertz, and 1 hertz, velocity will be the same because it will be 92% of Vs. But wavelength will be totally different. At 100 hertz, it could be 1 millimeter. At 1 hertz, well, it depends on the material. Okay? So, in this implementation here, when you speak about Rayleigh waves over half space with no dispersion, actually they are used in the last 10, 20 years as waves in labs. And they are called S -A -O -M -S -A -W. So, surface acoustic waves. Just the same, but at very high frequencies. We are used to see there are fractures in materials, for example. But at those frequencies, they are not of interest for the Earth. So we are going to a broader scale during the next lecture. OK? Um, you received the homework for the next Monday. Now you are able to give a look also to this animation here. I hope that the website is going up. Because you have some links there that you can follow to look at the animations. Okay? So, I want to make it clear. Uh, when uh, can we have a response to our previous homeworks to know the. No. Right now? <laughs> no, in the sense that usually I correct them, I give them a very quick look, I correct them before the written exam to give to you. Uh, I told you, they will be a tiny part of the final evaluation let's say 30% of the final evaluation. And usually, I give a response at the end. Also because the first homework was a little bit, you, I hope you knew in some way the answers. The last two homeworks are just a set of these exercises. And they're very easy. So, how to say? The role of official homework it's just to leave to you some confidence space to get practice and to have a, some helper for the final evaluation. Mm -hmm. There is nothing secret there. OK, so you on Friday, as you have noticed, the calendar for the next week is very chaotic because I have many meetings at the university. That's why today we have been doing 
two lectures and because your week was free and relatively so okay that's one but yeah I have to admit that making two slots in one day it's not easy for me, and I'm sure also for you, but I hope that you are really satisfied by the beautiful animations yes. and by the beautiful algebra that you discussed. <laughs> yes. okay. 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 Let's go. When you're going to start the other courses? Next week. Okay. Okay. Because one year ago, actually, you had already. I mean, you should have at least two courses running in this period. Up to now, just one. <laughs> okay.